So when you're selecting cheeses for a charcuterie board, you want to have a nice variety of textures and flavors to not only appeal to everybody, but to keep people coming back and keep people entertained. So we've got our softest cheeses, which are the brie, which I think is everybody's favorite. Moving on from the brie, we have softer cheeses like the chev, which is a goat cheese. It's a nice way to get a different flavor from your cow cheeses. Uh, it's usually a little grassier. We have a gouda, which is a cured semi-firm cheese. Then the harder cheeses we have are, I have a, a fancy cheddar cheese here. This is a, uh, a Trader Joe's aged cheddar cheese. The cheddar cheese is great because it's, it's accessible, especially you have kids and picky eaters, um, but it's also nice to get these fancy varietals. So people say, oh, cheddar, and then they taste it and it's a little unexpected uh, fun. And then finally, I have a manchego here. Uh, manchego is a Spanish sheep's milk cheese. So again, you're getting a slightly different flavor from the cows. It's a nice hard cheese and it's easy to present. Um, one other thing we're gonna put on here is the beer cheese. So before I open everything up, I say, let's dive right into a quick recipe and some nice skills. And then we will pull this board together right before your eyes. So beer cheese, let me get my notes. If you're, if anyone's, I didn't, didn't look like anyone's cooking along. If you are, we have some uh, beer that we need to boil off, which I did ahead of time. What you're doing is you're just boiling off a little bit of the beer to make it a little less alcoholic. Um, you're not reducing it. You're not boiling off the alcohol by any means, but you're just making it a little easier. Pardon me while I get my notes. So Michael, can I ask you oh. about sourcing cheese? About so what now? Sourcing cheese. Oh yeah, so yeah, yeah. Elfs, there's Trader Joe's, there's Whole Foods, and then there's everybody in between. So quality cheese, talk to us. I mean, do we, is, is Whole Foods the end all or is what we find at, at Ralph's just as good? Well, you know, it's funny you mentioned Ralph's. Ralph's has actually in the last probably month or so, they've upgraded their cheese counter. They, they're now supported by Murray's Cheese. Um, and so uh, cheese is pretty linear as far as price and quality goes. Trader Joe's is great for um, good variety, but it's not always the best quality. Your best quality is gonna be from a cheesemonger. I know in Claremont, we have, have a very fancy cheese shop. There's one in downtown LA, they're all over the place. Um, talking with people over the past few, few weeks when I'm at parties, I've asked people, you know, what draws you into a charcuterie board? What, you know, is, it, are, is there a specific cheese you're looking for? And they're like, no, they want it to look pretty. And at the end of the day, I've had, Oops. you know, $50 a wheel brie and $5 a wheel oh. brie, and it's all cheese. It's all pretty good. Um, you know, if you're doing a nice small party where you're gonna sit around and your focus is on this charcuterie, spend it. I've, I've spent 70 to $100 for cheese for four people. Um, that's not gonna be feasible for a big party and it's probably not worthwhile. Um, your, your sort of basics from Rouse and Trader Joe's are gonna be just fine. Um, you know, spend what you want. The more expensive, it's gonna be fancier cheese. It may not always be tastier for you. Buy what you like. Um, I think that's the joy of making things yourself is that you could do whatever you'd like and it's okay. Um, I, I've actually made boards that uh, I've affectionately called white trash boards um, that are a ton of fun. Uh, where you're sitting around for movie night and the, the, the charcuterie boards have like canned spree cheese and slices of bologna on them. And people love them because it is what you like. And so at the end of the day, the fancy cheeses are great, but if you don't like them, don't buy them. Thank How's you. that sound? You're welcome. I, Thank I have you. a question about the beer. <clears throat> yeah. Do you bring it up to room temp before you boil it or can you just boil it from cold? No, you could boil it from cold. Um, and then you cool it just a little bit. You don't want it hot because we're not melting the cheese. Uh, this is a dip that is uh, done in the food processor. So it's uh, a, a, a creamy dip, but it's not heated. And that's a good thing because when you heat cheddar it has a tendency to separate. 
uh, unless you do lots of fancy stuff to it. Uh, make a roux, fancy chemical salts, all that kind of stuff. This we want, it's a nice, easy recipe, um, but it's surprisingly creamy. And it's done that because of the food processor and the extra emulsive of, uh, of the uh, ketchup and the Dijon mustard that we add to it. So the beer, we just want to boil it and bring it and then uh, cool it a little bit to room temperature. Thank you. And, it, and you could go straight from the fridge. It, it, it'll just take a little longer to boil. So we've got our beer cheese recipe here. We've boiled off our beer. I've got shredded cheese, a pound of shredded cheese here, shredded cheddar cheese. And as I noted on my paperwork, it's always best to shred from the block. That pre-shredded cheese is great for like kids' quesadillas, but it has uh, coating on the cheese so it doesn't stick together in the package. And that coating, unless you heat it, has a tendency to make stuff a little dry. Like you're not gonna eat a, a handful of the shredded cheese from the packet. I have, it's not great. Um, so it's, it's better to shred from the block if, if you can. Uh, so we've got our cheese, we have our beer, I have the other ingredients measured out and it's all pantry ingredients. That's what I love about this recipe. Ketchup, Worcestershire sauce, little Dijon mustard, um, little garlic, very simple. And it has a quarter cup of chopped onions. So that brings us to our knife skill, which is how to properly chop an onion. So I'm doing this from a full raw onion from you for you. And let me try to get as close as I can. Oop. You were good before, actually. Yeah, we, was, can was, see it. we can see can that see? really well. We see it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, well, all right. I'll listen to there. you guys. That's that works. Good. That's it's good. A, that's good. Great. All right. So the first thing you, about an onion, it's difficult to chop. Um, but chefs do it a very specific way to get a very consistent chop and as easy as possible. First thing you want to do is you want to pick your right knife. This is a good chef's knife. Um, they come in different styles. This is a traditional chef's knife. And as you can see, it's curved along the blade. We have more Japanese styles that are flat. And you use whatever's comfortable. You want about a six to eight inch blade, depending on your hand size. You want to take the knife and before you use a knife, if your knife sets come with it, you use the steel. Um, a lot of people don't know exactly what the steel does. It doesn't sharpen your knife. It hones your knife. When you use your knife and you slam it against the cutting board, the tip of your knife, let's imagine it's this, slowly curls. And it's just by pressure pushing against the knife, or pushing against the board. What the steel does is you run the knife across the steel and it takes that curve and it straightens it out just a little bit. So it hones your knife, making it a little sharper. Sharpening your knife is actually removing that, that tip and creating a new one. And that's done with the sharpening steel, usually by a professional or, or a separate sharpening object. So you, when you take your steel, you run it, you run your knife across the steel at a very particular angle. And you think, oh my gosh, how am I going to know my angle? I, my kid has a protractor. I don't. Well, the steel tells you exactly the angle. If you look at the steel, there is a short end and a long end on the handle. If you hold the steel with the long edge to the top, rest your knife on the top, and then drop it down to the, drop the blade to the steel edge, that's exactly the angle that you should be holding when you hone your knife. So you take your knife, hold it on that flat edge, drop it down, and draw it across. You do that to the top and the bottom about six times. Always away from you, of course. And that hones your, that, that makes your knife ready to go. Uh, a sharp knife is a safe knife. Um, I've had lots of, lots of discussions and arguments with friends over the years who started to say, oh, a dull knife's better because it won't cut your skin. No, a sharp knife is better because it takes less pressure and you'll have more control over it. Um, so you always want to use the sharpest knife as possible. Can I ask now question? That, yes. how, often, how often are you doing that with your knife? Um, the steel, you, can, you pretty much could do every time you use a knife. It takes all of 15, 20 seconds. Oh. Um, so it, it's, it's really, you know, it's a good habit to get into. 
Um, at the very least, every three, four times, especially if you're using your knife a lot. Um, sharpening your, your knives, which is actually, you know, uh, Sir Latab has a sharpening service. Some of the fancier grocery stores do. Um, uh, sometimes old tobacco shops will have steel um, um, knife sharpening services. Those you want to do probably every year, depending mm -hmm. on the quality of your knife. The good German knives can take a new edge. Um, if you bought your knives at Kohl's, just buy new knives. <laughs> 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 yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> it, it is what it is. I have cheap knives. They're great. I just know to throw them away. Uh, the good knives, you, you, you probably either got them for a wedding gift or spent so much money on them that you remember exactly how much money you spent. Those you could resharpen and they're well worth it. All so, right, so we- Michael, I got another yeah. question for you. Yeah. So I'm looking at this, right? What you were talking about. And mine looks perfectly circular. Does that mean I have shit knives? <laughs> 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 There's no shorter long end. Oh, on your steel? Yeah. So it's there's there's no short it's circle. It's it oh on the on the handle. Then it's going to be the same angle all around all the way around. So does this mean this was like a really bad gift somebody gave me? No. I mean, <laughs> listen, I, far be it from me to criticize your friends and their gifting. Um, uh, what do you think their Christmas let's... gift this year? Doesn't it? Aren't you talking about the handle part? That's kind yes. of all global. Right. Yours it's has the black... that, Heather. See it? The black handle part. I can see it from here. It's right. oval. Mine's not black. It's like a, it's an oval. Is that right? Yeah. Right. So, this so it would be the long circular. edge. Okay, but this is circular. This part's circular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The steel part is always circular. Oh, okay. It's the it's the handle. There's usually a long and a short side. Uh, so if oh, you're an oval, there's oval a long. Or... Yeah. yeah so it's 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 the oh. handle part. Yeah. So if it's oval, that's fine. You know, this is okay. this is kind of okay. oval too. I want to be able okay. there's a long edge and a short edge and the long okay. edge tells All you right. the angle well, then i'll forgive my friend thank you <laughs> <laughs> so you're sharp i don't know if i will but if you will that's fine <laughs> and um, i'm still amazed that that's not a sharpener <laughs> you know no, right? first, i thought it was too i'm like i've never so used it I. before but <laughs> it's the the first time I, honestly I, when I, I i took this class a couple of years ago and when they told us that i was blown away because i i thought it was a sharpener um I thought it was interesting that there was never any instructions <laughs> on, on how to use it. It's just in the, the, the board, right. in the block. Um, and Michael, what is that device it called? Out, it's called a steel. A steel? A steel. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Can, can I ask one more question? So, yeah, of course. You your knife sharpened in like ever? Uh huh. <laughs> is it too late? And they're nice knives. Is it too late? No, it's never too late to, to get, them, get them properly okay. sharpened. Absolutely okay. not. Thank you. Absolutely not. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. All right. You, so we've if you have that, a kid store or someplace like that near you. They you can I'll tell you what I do. Once a year, you know, the knife guy shows up once a quarter to sharpen the knives. I know the day he's coming, the day before I take all the knives over that I want them to sh to sharpen, and the day after I go and pick them up. So you don't have to stay and wait because otherwise it takes forever, believe me. Wow. It, 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 it does. It's it's a smart thing, and sharpening in them at home is doable. They have very uh, you know fancy electric electric sharpeners. It's never as good as the professional stuff. It, yeah. I have I have one of the fancy sharpeners. I've done it a few times. It's better to get have somebody do it. It's just one of those things. You know, as we get older, we learn. Eh, I, I don't want to paint my own house. It's easier to hire somebody. Same thing with the knife. Spend the money and hire somebody, and it's usually not very expensive to do. And, and some of the more expensive brands, you send them back, you pay the shipping, they'll sh they'll sharpen them for you. Like Cutco, if anybody Cutco has, does that, yeah. I send my Cutco knives back, and it's unbelievable when they come back. They don't feel that dull when I send them. It's unbelievable what happens when they come back. So if you've got good knives, look it up. You may be able to just send them to the um, to the manufacturer. Absolutely. Good tip. All right. So moving on with our chopped onion. So what I've done is I've cut off the stem end of the onion, leave the root end on. That's going to hold your onion together. If we've chopped onions before, you know it has a tendency to split apart because it's all segmented on its own. That root end holds it together as we're chopping it. We're going to slice through the root end into half. 
So the root end is still holding the half of the onion together, but now I've created a flat surface to cut with. Flat surfaces are always easier than round surfaces, so just do it. No, it, you don't get bonus points for cutting a round surface. <laughs> make it flat, make it easy for you. Um, by doing it, it also makes it easy to peel the onion because it's a lot easier, it's already half exposed. Um, I always over peel the onion just because it's easy um, and I could afford more onion. I, I, I don't know. Uh, people are overly frugal sometimes with, with food. I get it. Um, I get frugality. I'm very frugal when it matters. Um, not for the pennies on an extra onion. Okay, so we have a half onion peeled flat side, root together. We can now start our chopping. And the way a chef chops a knife, the proper and easiest way to do it is we're creating a grid pattern in the onion and then slicing down to create the chop. So the size of our grid will be, will dictate the size of our, our pieces. If you want a chopped onion, that's gonna be a larger grid than a minced onion because mince is smaller pieces than chopped. So what we do, is we take the onion, hold it flat side down, <laughs> hold it with the top of our hand, we're gonna take our knife and we're gonna make parallel cuts to the, to the chopping board. Start about a quarter inch from the top and run through most of the way to the root. And just keep going. You have a nice sharp knife. It just goes right through the onion. So how, I does that not, how does that not go through you? <laughs> because you have a nice sharp knife. You start at the edge and just pull towards you about a quarter inch, every quarter inch. I have about four slices to the onion. Wow. Four horizontal. Now I do vertical slices going down. The great thing about an onion, if you, if you look at it, the onion tells you where to chop. It's segmented. It has little bits. If you want a uh, mince, you do it on every little line. If you want it chopped, you do it every other couple lines. The, the vegetable tells you what to do. Mm. So now I chop down. You'd already see little chopped pieces coming out. That's fine. So now I have a grid. I have horizontal and vertical cuts on the onion. Now I could chop straight down. and I get perfect chopped onion. All the pieces are the same size, which is important because it means they'll all cook at the same rate. Um, there's nothing worse than biting into undercooked onion in a dish, and that usually happens because it's chopped wonky. So you've got this, and we're all chopped up. No muss, no fuss, and a lot less tears. Mainly that's the glasses on my eyes, but that's okay. So for the recipe, it's a quarter cup of onion and we rinse it. Why do you I've rinse it? This recipe has you rinse it because if you, if you know an onion, it's very uh, sulfurous, it's very strong. And what rinsing it does after cutting it is it rinses away some of the onion juice that leaches out, makes it a little milder of a flavor. And that we don't want it to overpower the cheese, we want it to complement the cheese. So this we just rinse off real quick. I've done this long enough, so I know about two handfuls is a quarter cup. Um, I'm usually very uh, particular about measuring, but this, this is good anyway it goes. So I've got my cheese, my chopped onion, professionally done, my extra ingredients. Now I throw them all in the food processor. And in about a minute, we will have delicious cheddar cheese dip. Uh, if you don't have a food processor, it's probably one of the more important electric tools for a kitchen. Um, I use my KitchenAid stand mixer a ton for baking, but if you don't bake a lot, it's gonna collect dust more than anything. Food processor can do things that only a food processor could do. A stand mixer makes stuff easier for you, but you could do most of it with a hand mixer. Um, food processor is just well worth it. And the great thing about this recipe is since we're shredding cheese, you could shred the cheese in the food processor and not even really have to clean it <laughs> and then make the, make the dip, just change the blade. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna add all the ingredients into the food processor. 
have our shredded cheese. And you see everything sort of pre-measured in plastic. That's a big catering tip. I could do all the measuring for this a week ahead of time. The dip could be made three to four days ahead of time. I would be completely clean, done, and prepped days before the event and not have to worry about utensils, not have to worry about cleaning anything, just be done and ready. Well worth it. Got our cheese, our onion. And everything else. So if you make it in advance, how long will this last? Um, I've, I've had it, I think the recipe says about three days. Uh, uh, no, it says in the full article about three days. I've actually had it sit for a good five days without any problems. Um, since you're not cooking it, since you're put, not putting any heat to it, um, there's nothing to really degrade. Um, and all the ingredients are pretty shelf stable ingredients. Uh, so nothing's gonna go bad right away. Um, frankly, you'll eat it before it goes bad. <laughs> <laughs> so there's gonna be a little bit of noise as I run the food processor, but it's gonna show, a, I'll, I'll have a few tips on food processing. So with many recipes, you always get to a point where it just sort of stops moving. Uh, you see that a lot with the food processor. Uh, it's because the blade's creating air underneath and pushing the food up top. So you just have to stop every now and again, push the food down. It gives you a good chance to scrape the side. When you do this, most food processors come with a utensil that looks like a rubber spatula, but it's hard plastic. You don't wanna use a rubber spatula, which is a kind of a standard mixing or wooden spoon in a food processor. The blade will cut the tip of those and there's a chance you'll get splinters in your food or small pieces of plastic, which would sort of make you have to throw everything away. By the hard plastic, it won't get hit by the beater blade. It won't, it won't get hurt by it. it. It's a little, it's just safer. It's the right, right tool for the right job. So when you're so, processing, yeah, go ahead. Question, you have hot sauce in this recipe. Yes. For those of us who are wimpy white girls who don't like cheese, uh -huh. do, do you have to do that? Will it just take all flavor away? Um, I would, re you could reduce it. Um, okay. I, I wouldn't put less than like three quarter of a teaspoon to it. Um, it's a big, it's a pound of cheese. So it's a yeah. big volume. Um, and you could use a, one of the more flavorful hot sauces that's more flavor, less heat. Um, I put on there that I, 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 prefer, I like using Frank's Red Hot on here, which is the Buffalo Wing people, um, but they're hot sauce, not the Buffalo Wing sauce, which has like butter and other additives. I find it more flavorful and less hot. Um, you wouldn't wanna use a Tabasco here because that's a little vinegary um, and brings too much heat per, per unit um, for a full teaspoon and a half. Uh, another good, one is a tapatio, which is a little more flavor than heat. Same with Cholula. Um, okay. I would uh, I would avoid uh, any hot sauces with uh, a butt or a donkey on the label. Because those... <laughs> <laughs> okay, good tip. <laughs> you know, if you're buying them at an airport gift shop, it's not for this recipe. No, no. Uh, <laughs> Stay away from those. Yes. <laughs> But, but uh, you, it, it is a necessary flavor. It is a, a good flavor component for this. Otherwise it gets a little stingy. That is home okay. there. <laughs> okay, so I would just reduce the amount of the tapatio. Right. Okay, got it. Absolutely. So I don't know if you could see this, but we've got to the point where uh, professionally we call it the turn. It's where the food and the food processor starts rolling into a ball around itself. That means that it's fully getting processed. So we could scrape it down one last time and it's, it's a paste at this point. But now we're gonna add the beer. And the recipe says slowly drizzle the beer and you're like, but it's all sealed. How am I gonna do this in my food processor? Most food processors have a spout and inside the spout, there's a tiny little hole. 
And that hole is essentially, it's called the mayonnaise hole for the most part, because you use it to drizzle, may drizzle oil when you're making mayonnaise. You could put your liquid directly in the spout and it will slowly pour through that little hole, taking all the work out for you. Uh, kitchen tools are made to make things easier. Don't make it harder than it needs to be. So we're gonna drizzle our beer. And now you're just gonna let it process for about a minute because we're getting it nice and smooth. Um, I'm sure you can see it's, it's, there's no more ball rolling around. It's just a single smooth item. One final scrape. Get it all out. What we are left with is a very smooth, very creamy beer dip falls off the spoon. It's like consistency of a melted nacho cheese, but there's no heat, no heat to it. So it's melty at room temperature. You don't have to put any heat to it. It is fantastic right now. It's fantastic a day from now. Um, it's good with veggies. It's good with breads. Uh, I serve this uh, for a 4th of July lunch with homemade soft pretzels. And that was very well received. Um, and it's, it's great to have around. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good all around party dish. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna dish some up in a ramekin to put on our cheese board. And then we could, I could dish up the rest of it for the veggie board if needed. So there we go. It's a good, uh, it's a good recipe to bring places because you could do it ahead of time and everybody loves cheese, but you're not committing yourself to a full cheese board or uh, overpowering the hostess's other appetizers. So that is our first recipe and uh, first knife skills. Questions? Wish we could taste it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know it. I thought that too. Right. I, 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 it's, 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 it's really a shame. shame. It's, oh, oh, it's awful. And I wish you could smell it too. It's because there's a hint of the beer in the air, um, but you've taken the sharpness out of the beer by boiling it off. And uh, it's, it's, just, it, it's just very flavorful. You taste the cheddar, you taste the Dijon cheese mm -hmm. really well. Um, and then there's a little bit of the heat in the back, um, but nothing that, I, I don't think anyone would call it spicy. You'd call it flavorful. Is, is what it goes. I have a question. If you, yeah. you said no substitute for food processor, what if you have one of those like food ninjas? So well, the food, yeah, I've got, I've got a ninja and it's got a food processor attachment. So you wouldn't use the blender part, you would use the food processor part, which I don't know where I put my food processor part right now. Um, but yeah, so you, you wouldn't use the blender attachment, you use the food processor attachment, the one with the blades and the bowl. And, and that'll work fine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I use, I like the Ninja. It's, it, it, it saves a lot of space. Um, it's, it's no Cuisinart. art. I'm going to listen out here because what? I'm going to put my earphones on and listen right here. It's okay. Just like a cooking class. So. All right. So now we can move on to the rest of the charcuterie board. Um, and the great thing about a charcuterie board is that really there's not a lot of, there's no cooking involved. We're assembling, um, especially nowadays. There's, there's so, just such a big item that you could go to Trader Joe's, you could go to Ralph's, you could go to hell with Stater Brothers, and it's going to have everything you need to make a board. So I bought a bunch of things, we'll go over them, um, and then we'll assemble, a, we'll assemble the board. The main uh, focus is always the cheeses. So we're gonna start with the cheeses, lay those out of the board almost like little stations, and then fill in with the garnishes and the meats. So first, we've talked about the choice of cheeses. You want about two to three ounces of cheese per person for the party. Um, that adds up real fast. Um, if, you're, if this is a one of many appetizers, you could go to the low end. If this is the main appetizer, stick more to the three ounces. 
the easiest way to think about it is you're going to get about six to eight servings per pound of cheese. Um, and that's collectively, you don't need for each flavor. Um, so if it, it, you know, buy, buy what you need um, and always buy extra because A, there's no such thing about too much cheese. And B, I gave you a recipe for the fromage fort, which we're not going to do, but it's the best way to use up leftover cheese board ends. And you're essentially making a, like a homemade borson or alouette cheese. Um, with a little garlic, a little wine. It's the best dish for brunch the day after uh, a party when all you're happy about is that nobody else is in your house now. <laughs> and you're all alone and you're having a little bit of the leftover wine that you don't want people to know you're drinking. Um, it's great. And it's it's great sitting by the pool or sitting in front of the TV and, and chilling with, but it's, it's, it's a great way to use the leftover cheese on your board. Um, I do think that it's best to pre-slice the firmer cheeses on your board um, and even at least start the slices on the soft cheeses. Uh, no one wants to be the first person to cut into a hunk of cheese on a board. By having it pre-cut, you're more likely for it to, to be eaten. It's a little more welcoming. Um, also, that person who does decide to do the first cut in the cheese never does it right. They always cut from the middle of the brie or cut at a weird angle and then everybody else has to work around them. By you setting it up, you're dictating kind of how the rest of the, the slicing should go. You're dictating portion size. So if you need it on the low end, if you need it on the high end, um, and it just makes for a nicer presentation. We'll start with the Manchego, which is a nice hard cheese. It's got a waxy rind, which you don't want to eat, but it's nice to have because it's usually pretty colorful. A neat way to display this is you cut off the ends and then you cut slices that are about an eighth inch, quarter inch thick. I've switched my knife to a chef's knife, but if you could see it has these whiffles and the whiffles keep the cheese from sticking on the knife. If you ever cut into something sticky or set something solid and there, it vapor locks on your blade and when you lift it up, it's stuck to your blade. These whiffles will keep it from doing that. Nothing's perfect, but it keeps it a little extra. So we're gonna just slice this through. Um, I have a question for you, Michael. Whenever yeah. I cut you know, cheese ahead of time and it's like a couple days later, it's already gr grown mold on it. Is there a way to stop that from happening? Well, are you buying your cheese at Trader Joe's? Because usually that's Trader Joe's cheese. Um, oh. Honestly, it's just their, their supply chain is, is real quick. It's just how it goes. Um, the best way to store cheese is, is wax paper as opposed to Ziploc or Saran wrap. Um, because cheese is, yeah, I hate to say it, but cheese is kind of alive. Um, you know, it's kind of always growing. It's kind of always changing. Um, and the wax paper lets the air flow through and you're less likely to get moisture. And the moisture is what makes the mold. So would you store the sliced cheese then in a plastic bag in wax paper? No, 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 you could just wrap it in wax paper. Oh, literally just, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got, cause I've been practicing. So I have older, older pieces of cheese and they're just wrapped in wax paper. Um, uh -huh. It's the closest thing to cheese paper without actually buying cheese paper. Um, but yeah, I just kind of wrap it up and store it in, this is, you know, about a week old and it hasn't, hasn't degraded. Um, you really don't want to store sliced cheese that long just because uh, it'll dry out, even if it doesn't okay. mold, uh, just because there's more cut surface area. You know, the less surface area, the better. Um, but anyway, yeah, just store it in wax paper. Don't, don't so, store it okay. in saran wrap. Follow up question. I'm getting this Bridget Jones version of her cutting off all the mold and eating the remainder cheese. Oh, yeah. Is that healthy? Is that okay? Yeah, that's all right for the most part. Um, it depends on the cheese. Um, so I, I really can't speak to particular situations, but yes, for, for a lot of it, you could cut off the moldy part. Um, you know, all the flavorful part of cheese is mold anyway. The rind on brie is, I, okay. I, I, well, you know, the rind on brie is mold. Um, blue cheese is blue because of it's injected with mold and then grown with it. Um, it's, that's just cheese and mold go together. Okay. Um, and if it's if it's unappealing or more penicillin than cheese looking, um, <laughs> yes, you could cut you could cut it off. 
you'll know when it's not right because you'll see that, you know, let's call it green mold. Uh, you'll see that vein go beyond where you cut. That's not a good thing. If the cheese okay. doesn't smell appealable to you, that's not a good thing. Uh, trust your nose, trust your senses. Uh, you know, if it's a hard cheese and it's soft and wet, throw it away. Uh, but for the most part, when, you know, it, it, when you have a piece of cheese and it's a little, a piece of mold is growing in the corner, you cut a big hunk off and you, the rest of it's going to be fine. It's like cutting off a, that, that black part of a banana and eating the rest of it. So, okay. Uh, let's talk about how you're cutting that cheese, Michael. Yeah. So you cut that cheese, I don't know how to say it, like from the bottom up. Yeah, I cut it at the long triangle and I did that for a reason because we could present it in a, in a cool and empty way. What you could do is I've cut it and made it into triangles. If you take, you could take every other triangle oh. and now you've created some height yeah, cool. and some texture oh. on your cheese. I'll just do that. As, a, as opposed to cutting that small end first and cutting into the bigger, right? Right. So, all right. So now right. I have for you. I have a piece. I'm a Port Salute fan. So you can okay. see my salute here. Yeah, yeah. Now, Port Salute is a mushy cheese. It's a mushy cheese, right. How do you cut a mushy cheese? I mean, and what? I have these knives with the holes in them and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Work out okay. But how do you cut a mushy cheese if it's in, you know, the same, the same type right. as so that the, hard cheese? Yeah. So the mushy cheeses, you're only going to do a slice, a slice or two before putting it on your board. You're going to, the mushy cheeses, you want people to slice as they're eating it. Um, because if you slice a mushy cheese, those slices are just going to sort of melt at room temperature and become more mushy. So you're gonna serve the mushy cheeses more in a block and start the slicing for people as opposed to finishing it completely. Okay. Okay? The so harder, cheese, the harder that, cheeses, you can have more fun too. Okay, on that manchego, are people yeah. eating the rind or no? Um, it is edible, but it's not flavorful. So yeah. there's always gonna be some weirdo who eats the rind, but most people are gonna eat around it. Okay. <laughs> You know, brie is, is a little different. Like brie is an edible rind. Um, and then there are some people who refuse to eat it, um, which is fine. I mean, it, it, but you don't have to cut it off for serving. So I'm gonna actually transfer this to a board. For my board, I'm using big white board. You could use cutting boards. I have I have this neat board that a friend got me, which is like this, and it spill, spills out into multi-layers. Very Etsy, but very fun charcuterie board. But do whatever works. I like these. This is from Smart and Final. It's plastic. It's great for catering because it looks good. And then you don't have to worry about taking it home if you take it to somebody's house. So we want a board big enough for everything. And we're gonna lay our cheeses in like little, in little, section, little sections. Um, you don't want all the cheeses come together you want them to spread out in the board. So we're gonna lay down the manchego first. We're gonna take this brie, my cheeses. You wanna keep, have the cheeses out for about a half hour before serving um, when it's 93 degrees, maybe less. <laughs> Cause right now every cheese is a soft cheese. But we'll make it work. Okay, here's the brie. So here's the brie. The brie we're just gonna sit at a full round. Ah. Because it's a soft cheese, so you don't want to pre-slice it too much. And we're going to slice some small wedges so people know how to do it. Maybe take one of the wedges out because the hardest wedge to get out is always the first one and stick it on top. 
then you're kind of just letting everyone know expectation for the cheese. I'm gonna put a blue on there because I like stinky blue cheese. Not everyone does, if you don't, don't buy it, but people look for it. Um, and blue cheese is great with the accoutrement. This is a softer blue cheese, so I'm not gonna pre-slice it. But again, I'm gonna take a slice down. And then we're going to do cheddar cheese. I might want to snack here. <laughs> Please, I hope you're snacking. <laughs> this, this, this should make you guys feel hungry. Mm -hmm. Cheddar cheese you could do in slices. I'm gonna do this in cubes just so it's a different texture and a different look. But you could do however you'd like. Let me now I don't wanna do too much mainly because it's a Wednesday night and I, live alone and I could only eat so much cheese. Although the office is very excited about getting my leftover cheese board tomorrow morning. All right, so we've got our cheeses up there. And then I'm gonna put the beer cheese in the center. Um, aesthetically, and I'm sure any of you in the visual arts will be able to, to know this, uh, you wanna do things in odd numbers if you can. Three cheeses, five cheeses, seven cheeses, just more appealing to the eye. Uh, if you look at flower petals, they're always an odd number of petals. Uh, it's just the way our vision is built. So work with it. All right. So we got our cheeses. We now have our garnishes. Cheeses are very fatty. Actually, you know what? Let's do the meats first. There we go. Okay. Put my board side. Mm. All right. I got some dry salami and the mix of uh, calabrese, capicola, and some prosciutto, the Italian stuff. It's great just buying the variety packs, not having to slice them. Um, if you are pre-slicing it, nice and thin, um, but I don't because I could buy it pre-sliced and it's just fine. The trick with the meats is people have, people often will take this slice, this row of sliced meat and plop it on the cheese board. That is difficult and unappealing. Um, what you wanna do is you wanna manipulate the meat just a little bit to give it a little height, make it a little inviting. The way you do that is simply folding the salami. It's amazing how much of a difference folding the salami just a little bit makes it more appealing. It makes it roughly, makes it a little height, makes it a little easier to eat. So we take our slice of salami, just fold it in half. Keep them in your hand, kind of like playing cards. Fold. If I take five of these guys, I now have a nice half moon shape. Looks like a flower petal and it's ready to go. Much easier, much more inviting. Um, and it allows you to sort of spread it around the board and make it a little more appealing. You wanna to try to put the meats with the cheeses that it goes with. Meats don't go great with brie. They don't grow great with blue. They go great with Gouda, cheddar, um, harder stuff. So let's put it around the beer cheese. Another thing you could do, especially with the larger slices, like this is a larger Genoa salami, let's fold it in half and then fold it in half again makes almost like a little tulip shape. Again, you do that with a couple slices, line them up around each other. And now you have ruffled meat with some height that takes up some more space. It's easier to pick up. It looks more artisan because it doesn't look machine sliced anymore. So you just kind of line it up. 
line it up on a board and just lay it on the lay it on the board anywhere you like. All we're doing is filling in spaces. Um, no hard and fast rules on any of this, other than bountiful is better. And if your board doesn't have a lip, put the stuff that's not going to move on around the edges. I mean, that's that kind of goes without saying. Um, I have particular issues with prosciutto. People love prosciutto. I love prosciutto. I don't often love how it's served. Um, they come in big long slices on a little piece of, of backer, backer plastic. People will often take it off the backer plastic and ruffle it up like this one big slice is one serving. I find this too much prosciutto. Um, if you've ever eaten prosciutto, there's long strings of fat mm -hmm. in it. Sometimes it's difficult to eat. What I prefer to do is take the slice of prosciutto and slice it in half widthwise, just so it's more of a square. You're cutting that long piece of fat. You're making it a little easier to eat. Put it on the board and just kind of scrunch it together, maybe make it a little circle. And it makes a little prosciutto rosette. Again, it's not science, you're just kind of folding the meat on itself, but you're now making a little prosciutto packet that's much more, that's easier for the guests to pick up and enjoy. It's a better mouthfeel um, and it's less of a mouthful. Um, so it'll make the prosciutto last a little longer, which is expensive, um, but I just think it's, it's more fun and better to eat this way. I do think prosciutto goes well with brie. Uh, traditionally, brie's not a lot, not with a lot of meat, but I think prosciutto is mild enough where it goes well. So we're just kind of ruffle those up and put it around. Again, this could be as full or as thin as you want it to be. I'm not going super super full yet because I have lots of garnishes. I like a lot of garnishes on the cheese board um, because it's what makes the charcuterie unique and interesting. Otherwise, it really is just a deli platter. Let's do that. Let's put some capicola, which is the thicker beefy salami. And we'll lay those on. There we go. Okay, so we've got meats and cheeses laid about the backboard of any cheese board. If all we had is meat and cheeses and it was full, I'm sure it would be fine, um, but it's better and better looking with the garnishes. Any questions so far? Michael, I usually put preserves and honey. Yeah. Uh huh. Are you just putting garnishes, or are you adding? Well, also? I'm calling that's going to be. I'm calling that as one of the garnishes. Okay. Um. Yeah. So, so the the garnishes are are sort of everything that's not meat and cheese. Um. And what you're doing with that is you're introducing different textures and different palates because cheeses and meats are essentially savory and fatty. So we want to add briny. We want to add sweet, we wanna add other sort of flavors to cut all that and complement it. So every bite can be different on the charcuterie board. People can build their little sandwich with what they want. Um, the trick with the garnishes is you want variety. Don't feel the need to put all that you bought on here. Fill it up throughout the evening. A full board is an inviting board. It's easy enough to add a, add some extra cornichon, add some extra uh, <laughs> preserves or what have you, um, just to sort of keep it keep it updated throughout the evening. I have here the mini pickle, the cornichon. They're pretty traditional. And, and where we are, wanted, and yeah. where are we getting those pray tell? Trader Joe's. Everything oh. I bought, everything here is either Trader Joe's or Ralph's. Oh. Um, I, nothing, nothing fancy for, uh, anything that's small and roly poly or extra wet. 
put it in a little bowl if you can. Ramekins are great. You have little ramekins. This is, you know, a little creme brulee ramekin. Adds a little pop of color as well. Are those sweet pickles? The cornichons are a little uh, more of a dill. Hold on as I eat one for you. Show, a little show. on the spicy side. There we go. Cornichons. Yeah. I, I call them baby pickles. <laughs> they're baby pickles. That's all they are. Um, they're not quite full dills, but you could get baby dills. These have a little, um, almost a garlicky heat to them. It's kind of nice. Other bowls, you could get fancier. I have these in my collection. They're ceramic white leaves. Uh -huh. I'm gonna put some olives in there. Again, Trader Joe's, marinated with uh, lemon and herb. If you can, I mean, pitted is probably is better. It's less spinning from your guests. Um, but olives with the pit taste better. So it's so up to you. Better. So <laughs> much better. Oh, they do, don't they? So they're, worse spit, they're worse spitting out the pit. And it, honestly, it, if, if you're, if you're at a friend's it. house, you could do you it. You have it's an fun. extra little dish there, no problem. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So we're gonna lay that out. Um, I also bought, but I think I'll save that for a crew today. Um, some fire roasted artichoke hearts. I saw this at Trader Joe's. This would be a great addition if you wanted something a little more savory. I'm going to move on to our sweet component. Blue cheeses. Um, a lot of these cheeses really go great with a sweet. Um, someone mentioned honey and jam. I'm not a big fan of putting honey on a charcuterie party platter because it gets sticky. It's difficult to serve properly. Um, it's difficult to serve without dripping. Um, I don't care how fancy your honey bear is, a honey bear on a cheese platter just makes it a little, <laughs> little chintzy. Um, and, and as a, the caterer, caterer in me wants to keep things as neat and tidy as possible. So I'm a big fan of preserves. Uh, apricot preserves is sort of traditional with your stinking cheeses. Fig is good too. Fig is great. Um, and they, they now sell, you know, at Ralph's, they sell yeah. a whole run of, of the fig jams and, and raisin jams and, and jams with port that goes with specific cheeses. Go crazy. It's fantastic. So this I, I have is just smart and final apricot jam um, because it's cheap and easy. We need us. Yeah, Ralph's has, uh, Ralph's, uh, for those of you who live in the Riverside area, Canyon Crest Ralph's has an incredible, incredible cheese area. It's yeah, that's the Murray's Cheese Counter. And, and they've, they started those at the Fresh Fairs like, that, like the one in Canyon Crest and, and, and some of the newer ones in Riverside and other areas. And they're now expanding that to all the Ralph's. Um, and it's actually a really nice thing with with the uh, the Ralphs and their fancy cheeses is, is at least mine isn't selling a ton. And uh, they've discounted, I've gotten cheeses that were like eight, $10 a wedge for 99 cents because they have to, they have a sell by date. Um, and they're usually good a good week after you buy them. So, uh, you know, 99 cents for a $10 wheel of brie is, is, is pretty nice. Um, so I put some preserves in here. To boost it, I'm going to, in the same ramekin, throw in some dried apricots. People could draw from this. It also kind of adds, I don't have to fill it up all the way with jam because people aren't going to have that much. Michael, what you are put we the jam next to the blue beer cheese. cheese. Huh? What are we sticking into the beer cheese? What, to, to eat it or? Yeah, as, is there going to oh, be like some kind of dipping situation or what? There's absol here? absolutely, that's okay. the, the crackers are the end part um, because they don't want to be the star of the show. Um, I only put crackers on the board if there's, if I need to fill. I like having the crackers on a separate plate. Um, and, you know, I talked crackers at the end, but just because we brought it up, um, I think it's, it's easier to have them on a separate plate than the main cheese because they're not supposed to be the star. I'm not a big fan of overly flavored crackers, although I love pretzel chips. 
for a charcuterie board, especially with the beer cheese. It's fantastic. Um, but pretzel chips add a little flavor without stealing. I think they complement really well. So we're gonna add a little more of the dried fruit just kind of on the board to add color. Another dried fruit I really love is Trader Joe's. These are dried mandarin slices. Um, orange marmalade goes really great with cheeses. Um, so it's a wonderful addition. And these mandarin slices are a great um, sort of complement to that. They go really well with the brie. Um, I know from experience last night. So <laughs> we're gonna add that on there. Fruits are great, but I don't like a lot of cutting because a cut fruit is a juicy bleeding fruit. They have lovely small fruits that you could have served whole on here. People could take on their plate and walk away from. These are the new, um, well, I don't know about new, but they're cherry plums. They're small little plums about the uh, size of a cherry on steroids. Mm -hmm. They're delicious and you can serve them whole on a board. Um, they're nice to sort of fill in in areas. And they're easy to sort of replenish throughout. Set one on top of the brie for fun. Another fruit that's very classic and just spectacular are figs. Figs. There's nothing like a cut fig. Absolutely nothing. And what's great about the figs is they're a wonderful um, option if you don't want a cracker. Now, I did have a question early on about sort of keto sweets that you could put on a cheese board. Um, blueberries are keto friendly. So that's an easy thing. And uh, I know Smucker's has a pretty decent line of sugar-free jams, including a sugar-free apricot. Um, that's very good on here. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but the blueberries are great. Loving. And I have a little trick with the blueberries. I'm not a big fan of putting small fruits all on here just because uh, blueberries, raspberries, they're a little difficult to handle, a little difficult to hold. And they have a tendency to squish, you know, when people pick it up and you get your dirty fingers. So instead, toothpicks are your friends. Blueberries on a oh. toothpick. Oh. Raspberry, blueberry on a toothpick. Great, perfect. Great idea. I, 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 and I have to credit to Kathleen and her on board, board select recipe book selection. I read through it and this was one of the tips. Fantastic. I, I saw this and I'm like, how did I never do this? Um, they stick up great on the brie. You could have a lovely pile of them oh. anywhere you'd like. And they're easy for people to take and go. That, that is such a great idea. I, I, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, was, I was floored when I saw that, that in the book. Like, ah, that's so easy. We've got grapes. And the trick with grapes is we get the big bunch, cut them into small bunches. Yep. Don't, not individual grapes because they roll around, but small bunches. Put them, you could put them together. And they could look like a big bunch, but when people grab them, they have just enough for their plate. Um, I, I told this to our right. office manager and she's like, well, I do that for my kids. Duh. <sighs> and I'm like, well, then you teach the cheese course. But it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real great, it really is. It's a real great tip. And, and I think it's, I, I don't know. It's just, like, I'm going to do this now with all, with just grapes when I buy them. So I'm more likely to actually eat them and not throw them away at the end of the year. Um, okay. That's exactly it. <laughs> oh, I often joke that somewhere my face is on a wanted poster in like a banana village for murdering bananas. Because all I do is buy bananas and they go bad on my counter. That's I, am, I am right there with you on that. <laughs> I have hey. like one and then they go bad. When they start I, to I, go, I, I just throw bread. them in the freezer and then I use them for banana bread. That, that's exactly, but how much banana bread can I make? Well, they'll I, freeze for, they freeze for a long time do. and you usually need at least three for a loaf, so. You do, and they're, they're, the frozen are good in smoothies too. Yep. Um, but I, again, I'd rather have ice cream in my freezer, but that's just. 
<laughs> We've got a pretty full plate going on, but the last thing I want to add are some nuts. Um, again, this is, you know, for our keto friends, this is a great addition. It goes really, really good with um, uh, blue cheeses, soft cheeses, because it adds a nice component. Um, I like using walnuts. Almonds are very traditional, and I did buy a bag of fancy olive oil sea salt almonds from Trader Joe's. Um, walnuts, I think, are a little more unexpected. They also take up a little more volume, which is, which is nice on a board. The trick with nuts is toast them. Do not serve raw nuts. Raw nuts are health food, and raw nuts are health food because they taste awful. But a, <laughs> but, but a toasted nut is delicious. A toasted lightly salted nut is even better. Um, I do suggest going for lightly salted if you're going to go for anything because the meats are already salty. A lot of cheeses are already salty. You don't want to have a big salt bomb. But, um, you know, a little, little salt is a good thing. But either buy them pre-toasted or about eight to 10 minutes in a 375 degree oven. Use your nose. You'll smell the nuts when they're, when they're ready to go. Um, we'll just do that. We'll put some almonds on there. You just put them in the oven raw? Or do you put nuts? anything on it? Yeah. No, no, you, yeah, you don't have to put anything on it. No, oh. um, because nuts are naturally oily. Yeah. So when you, when you toast them, the, that oil comes out and that's what toasts them. Um, so yeah, you just put them in raw. I always put them on aluminum foil so I don't have to do dishes afterwards. Um, but that's, they're, they're pretty straightforward, pretty easy to go. Cool. How long did you say? Um, it's usually about eight to 10 minutes, it's about 375, but um, it's, it's variable. Uh, depends on the size of your nut, if your nuts were in the fridge or freezer, if they're at room temperature. That's why I said just use your nose. Um, the moment you smell, ooh, that smells like nuts, they're done. Pull them out of the oven. Um, and they'll carry over cook a little. If they, if they don't look brown, they'll carry over cook a little bit on the cookie sheet as they cool down. Um, and then you always want to make sure toasted nuts are cooled. So to do them the day before um, or let them cool for at least a half hour because you don't want uh, to serve that that sort of hot nut, um, it's a little dangerous. It's it's it can be not too fun. So we've got boards as full as finished as you want it, but I've got oh, here wow. a lovely charcuterie board that was made by talking with you. Took took what time it did. Uh, we've got a homemade item of beer cheese on it and we are ready to eat. Um, there we go. Any questions? Oh, work of art. <laughs> Fabulous. Yeah, it, it, it really, it's so nice being able to buy these things and not having to, to get them yourself, not having to make everything. Um, and like I said, you, you saw me open up the items and put them on the board. Um, it's, it's just about buying the variety and then letting the mix and match go. The other great thing, you could do this a good hour or two ahead of time, put some, pl put, put some plastic wrap on it, put it in the, in the fridge. Um, I wouldn't do it the day before, but a few hours is fine and just let it come up to room temperature for about a half hour before people come. Michael, I have a question. Yeah. What's your address? <laughs> <laughs> We're all, we're all coming, we're all coming our way. way. <laughs> it's going to be a knock on Good the door question. in about 30 I, I am in, I'm in the heart of Rancho Cucamonga. If anyone's near uh, Milton and Baseline, feel free. <laughs> See you so in about beautiful. five minutes. <laughs> yeah. So ladies, who created a charcuterie board along with Chef Michael? Can we see it? Did anybody do anything remotely resembling a charcuterie board? I know Jan has the ingredients. What did she do with I them? I do. I, well, we've been eating and nibbling. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Me too. Uh, that's the best thing. Exactly. Do. We don't have any cheese left. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think Heather did something. We want to see what Heather did. No, I was eating too. <laughs> We so have I got a question for large crowd. You started in the beginning yeah. saying, you know, um, you could spend a lot of money on this. Right, right. Yeah. So, right. And, you know, I got some members of my family could eat the whole freaking board by themselves. So, 
Well, that's um, where the garnishes come in, really. They're, yeah, they, okay. Yeah. Um, some veggies and fruit and all that. that that's exactly it. It, it. it sort of spreads, you know, when you're putting a little bit of brie on a toast and, and adding all the extra stuff, it, it makes it last longer. Um, yeah. uh, one quick sort of final bit on, on sort of the crackers and toast. Like I said, you don't want them to be the star. So really, I, you know, they sell these like multi-grain toasts with the fruit, the nuts already in it. Those are great for cheese and crackers, but I think they're a little redundant on a charcuterie board because it's putting the garnishes in the cracker. Um, so I like, you know, very sort of simple brioche toast, cracker assortment. I will say as a baker, I'm not a huge fan of this, but uh, if you have gluten-free friends, it's a great way to get sort of rice crackers or nut thins and have them in a separate board so they could uh, enjoy. Because most of the other items are gluten-free um, and, uh, you know, cheese and things like that. I, I always leave it to the person with the allergy to sort of gauge how strict they need to be. But offering a rice cracker or nut cracker is, an, is a nice way to sort of be as inclusive as possible. Thank you, and you're Michael. not doing anything with it. You're just, you're just yeah. buying it. You're adding it to it. But it's, it's well worth it. And it, you, it'll get appreciative. Um, you know, if you know a friend who's gluten-free is coming, definitely do that. Even if you don't, I like the rice crackers on their own and I'm not gluten-free. Um, so you're not sacrificing flavor. Like even just three, five years ago, you were sacrificing a lot. Now you're not. They're fantastic gluten-free alternative. And it's just, it's nice to be a little inclusive like that. Thank you, Michael. Cause I <laughs> run into situations all the time where there's no, nothing gluten-free. In right. Yeah, I think it's, I, I just think it's a little, it's a little extra. Um, all right. Well, I am going to move on if there's not any more questions on the charcuterie board. Um, and we'll move on by making sort of a bridge recipe. And that's the caprese skewers with the uh, creamy mm. pesto dip. So caprese skewers are, are pretty oh, standard yeah. sort of oh, I, I was supposed to keep it so <laughs> sort of appetizer. Let me see. Pardon me. I, I made one, but my husband ate it. <laughs> <laughs> it had basil oh. and mozzarella on it, but. No, yeah, I will show you the end. This is a, a nice <laughs> That looks good. <laughs> so I do have uh, toothpicks with little funny bits on them, but any toothpick works. It's cherry tomatoes, the uh, little bite-sized mo soft mozzarella. Uh -huh. I like wrapping one of the tomatoes in a basil leaf. Now, if I'm serving these as a standalone um, appetizer, I will drizzle them with balsamic or even uh, oh. store-bought pesto. But if they're on a board, either a veggie board or a charcuterie board, that gets a little messy. So it's great to have this creamy dip, which works good with all vegetables and adds a punch to these caprese skewers. And the reason why I like the dip recipe, let me pull it up. This is the reduced fat creamy pesto dip. Um, is the reduced fat action, uh, action of it. It's a neat technique that you can use on any creamy dip. What it is, is you're taking a cup of cottage cheese and blending it with about a quarter cup of boiling water. So you boil the water, measure out a quarter cup, throw them in the blender, you blend it for about 30 seconds. I did it ahead of time because I didn't want too much noise. But let's see where, there we go. Oh, pardon me. I have so many bowls and prep work. Let's see. Uh, trying to keep everything cool. Okay. Here's a, another quick catering tip. These guys, they're called deli containers. It's what you buy your macaroni salads and Spader Brothers in. They are. Uh, literally almost a dime a dozen on Amazon. Every different size. They're dishwasher safe um, if you want to keep them, but you could also just throw them away when you're done measuring things. So they're great pre-measuring. So when you're mixing, you're ready to go and then you can throw it away, less dishes to do. So let me show you 
So I cut, pureed cottage cheese, boiling water in a blender and you get creamy. It's about the consistency of yogurt. No oh. cheese curds. It's like sour cream and it's a great sour cream alternative. You wouldn't replace it 100%, but replace like 50% of a sour cream with this cottage cheese. You're upping the protein, lowering the fat in a creamy dip. It's great for ranch dip, any sort of sour cream based French onion. Um, and it's, it's just a way to sort of sneak in a little healthiness into, into tasty things. So the pesto dip comes together in a bowl. We've got the cup of cottage cheese. We've got a cup of sour cream. The recipe says use low fat sour cream. I'm using full fat sour cream because I bought it for the other recipe. That's the other sort of catering tip is there's, uh, there's a method to choosing these recipes. I chose the beer cheese because it's mainly pantry ingredients, can go on the crudité platter, can also go on the uh, charcuterie platter. The pesto dip can go with the caprese skewers, which could go on either platter, and the pesto dip is standalone for the veggies. Plus you're using fresh basil. Leftover fresh basil leaves is a great garnish for adding some greenery on your charcuterie or crudité board. So you're already buying an herb that you're using in a recipe and a garnish. Finally, the green goddess dip, you have leftover chives, tarragon, other herbs, which are great garnishes for the other dishes. So you're cross-referencing and cross-using all these recipes. So you'll have less waste and you're able to sort of utilize everything you're buying, even if it's more than for just the recipe. We got our wet stuff in here. And then we're adding everything else. We've got the Parmesan cheese, the basil and garlic. Now I don't tell my Italian grandmothers, but I have the jar of pre-chopped garlic. We all have the jar of pre-chopped garlic. Use that in cooked things. Don't use it for raw stuff. If you're using you for raw stuff, press a real garlic clove through, a, through your garlic press. It's a much better flavor it's, it's just better all the way around. What if we don't have the fresh basil? Can we use the dried stuff? No, you really need to oh. use the fresh stuff. Um, Can you use parsley or some substitute? Not really, because oh. this is a pesto dip. So uh, pesto, you, you can make a pesto out of anything, but this is really made with basil. You, since uh, the Parmesan cheese is re isn't really gonna go with the other herbs. Oh, um, okay. yeah, it's, it's really meant to, to be a pesto. Um, that being said, it's a fantastic pesto. And what's really nice about this is since it's a sort of a creamy pesto dip, it's good and not just a dip, but I have served this with zoodles and made like a side salad with it. Oh. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I've, I've put this on top of, of grilled chicken. And now you have sort of a creamy pesto chicken. Um, very nice. It's, it's, it's a very um, uh, universal recipe. It's easy to use. So That's we're just good. adding everything together. Final Basil. ingredient is olive oil. Yeah. Basil is a fabulous herb to grow in your garden. It is. Because then you'll always have access to the big fresh basil leaves. Absolutely. And it grows like a weed. You don't have to. You don't have to be a good gardener for it. No. Well, that helps. So, doing a tablespoon of olive oil, good extra virgin olive oil. Um, again, since it's not cooked, you want a, the highest quality, most flavorful extra virgin olive oil you could get. Michael, and you, what brand did you use, Michael? I like this yeah. California brand. Oh. Um, it's very highly rated on, on taste tests. They have different levels of it. Um, I, it different levels by meaning intensity of the olive flavor. And there are, it's all on the label. It's very well labeled. And where, um, where do you get that? This is, this is commercially available. This is available at Ralph's and uh, you know, higher end stores. 
Uh -huh. uh, the other things I like, I do get um, the artisan olive oils from occasion. We have in Claremont, we have both a Vom Foss and a Wee Olive. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot, you know, th those sort of olive oil tasting bar bars are all over the place and they're great, especially the uh, sort of flavored olive oils. Yeah. Um, if to have raw, you know, the, there's a blood orange olive oil that makes a phenomenal salad dressing. Um, and it's a fun thing to get into. You know, people are into bourbons, people are into whiskeys, people are into beers. You could be into olive oils just as easily. Yeah. Um, and it's a fantastic thing. So anyway, it, the, the dip, it, dip just comes together. Yeah. If you all haven't been to the Temecula Olive Oil Company, you need to go. Mm -hmm. they, they have a farm where you could actually go and the tour of the olive trees and they give you tests of the olive oils and vinegars. Um, but they have a store in Old Town Temecula and, and they have an olive oil and an olive oil and um, a vinegar club. The olive oils are absolutely, utterly outstanding. Mm -hmm. I make a run probably every two months. Yeah. I, I yeah. sense a field trip for our group. <laughs> In the future. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and you know, they're, that they're, they're near wineries, I'm just going to say. I, yes, that's right. <laughs> they're not too far from some wineries. So anyway, yeah, I've Michael, got, and they I've have got a, uh, Michael, they also have a lot of picnic grounds there where we could ask you to bring everything. That is, that is, that is true. <laughs> and that the olive true. oil. Now, so I've got lots of leftover basil, a little garnish, we're good to go. Um, like oh. I said, this is a great, great serving. And it, it, it lasts for a good, you could do this easily a day to three days in advance. And the flavors just deepen. Um, and like I said, leftovers on zoodles and things like that, it's fantastic. It's, it's, it's a good, well-rounded dip. On what? Zoodles, zoodles. which are z those, those zucchini noodles, you know, where the spiralized zucchini and the uh -huh. other squashes. Uh -huh. um, I even just toss with, with sort of grilled vegetables. Um, because it has that flavorful pesto component, but it also has the creaminess of the, the sour cream and the cottage cheese in it. Um, so it, it's a, it makes a real good sort of summertime quick side salad uh -huh. if you need it. Wonderful. Um, and again, I like repurposing recipes. Yes. We've got to so. do something about Zoom. It has to give us an opportunity to taste not just see and hear. <laughs> I, I know it. I, know. I, I actually thought of, you know, well, gee, maybe I could, you know, ask Anne or, 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 or Kathleen, maybe I should go to their place and, you know, so I have like a compadre with it. Right. Um, but I just thought that would make everyone else jealous. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely would. Yeah, yeah definitely. definitely. Right. Okay. So I'm sure you can see my dirty sink in the background, but please let that, let that go. Judge me afterwards. All right. <laughs> so before we get to the crudite de board, let's go ahead and make our final dip. So it's again out of the way and ready to go. And that's the green goddess dip. Green goddess dip is, is one of my favorite uh -huh. alternatives to ranch. Um, green goddess was like huge in the 70s and early 80s and it yeah. sort of fell out of favor. Um, but it's, it's a great throwback and it's a different flavor. It feels homemade too. Um, you know, ranch dip is great. If you're gonna do it, like make the fancy one with the sour cream and the, the packet. But um, people expect that. And, and especially on a crudite hay board, at least for me, if I have like carrots and ranch dip, that feels like Weight Watchers lunch. <laughs> that doesn't feel like a party. So uh, let's, let's do a little something different. And, and punching up the dips is one way to do it. We've got the creamy pesto, we have the beer cheese, um, and let's do the green goddess. Some versions of green goddess use avocados as their base, is sort of the green component. Um, that's traditional in some circles. This is traditional by using tarragon as the main herb. I like it, or not everyone does. Tarragon is a, a leafy, very aromatic herb uh, that is uh, anise flavor, that black licorice flavor. That's a big turnoff for some people. It's not, doesn't taste like eating a licorice whip. It's a lot more herbaceous. It's very um, traditionally served with salmon. Um, but it's a great complement to uh, vegetables and, and other flavors. I also think it's just something a little unusual that we don't see every day. Um, and that that's what a party's about is sort of exploring. And, and in general, a crudite platter, which is, you know, it's just the fancy word for vegetables, 
uh, I mean, it doesn't mean vegetable, but you know what I mean, um, is, is a, a chance to sort of explore all those uh, things and sprouts that you look at and think, oh, neat, but you never buy because, you know, you just want something for lunch. So buy them, get a little exotic, get a little crazy with the crudite platter. The worst that could happen is you throw it away and you wasted $3. It's, it's, it's fun. It'll be inviting. It'll be a great chance for people to try things that they haven't before. Um, and it makes you look like a, a good and thoughtful host as well. So green goddess dip is a lot like the creamy pesto dip in that it's dump and stir, um, which is it's my, my favorite thing. So it's a mayonnaise and sour cream based dip. Um, you could use uh, low fat if you want. Um, I generally have the low fat mayonnaise in the house because frankly, it, it tastes just like the, uh, the other stuff. Uh, the fat free is not good, but this, this one's fine. So we're gonna jump that in again. It's pre-measured. Michael, can I ask what's on your stove simmering? What's on my stove simmering is uh, boiling water for some of the crudités. If you were, uh, one of the handouts was how to prepare um, different vegetables for a vegetable platter, and that's really. It's what makes a vegetable platter hard is, you know, we're raw broccoli tastes like raw broccoli. Mm -hmm. It's fine, but it's not great. If you blanch that broccoli for about a minute, shock it in some cold water, like I'm gonna do, it transforms it into something flavorful, inviting and edible. Um, by blanching and shocking vegetables, again, we'll get to that as part of the board creation. Um, it opens up a wider range of vegetables for a vegetable platter, aside from your celery, carrots, olive, and cherry tomato, which again, looks like a Weight Watchers lunch. So by doing the, the blanching, we could have green beans, asparagus, um, things that you only think of as cooked, but as a cold preparation on a veggie platter. So that's what's boiling in the back. Thank you, thank you. You're welcome. So this uses raw garlic again, so I'm gonna put it through my garlic press. And this is two cloves. And I'm sure there's many of you that when you see two cloves, you automatically put three cloves. And I'm one of those people, so it's five. Extra garlic, never hurt anyone. My last name is Ventimiglia. It's kind of standard. So generally, if you have a chopped garlic in a recipe, do you always press? If, if the chopped garlic's not cooked, okay. if, if it's a, if in a, a cook preparation, I'll get the jar. I mean, because you're, it's going to be fine. Um, but I mean, when as it's opposed raw, to actually chopping the garlic. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I, I find mincing the garlic uh, a pain. Yeah. Um, because it's small and it's slippy and it's, it's hard. They, the garlic press, the only hard part of a garlic press is cleaning it. Um, and all you need is a stiff brush and it pushes through the holes. It's not hard, um, but it's well worth, it's an it's a easy time saver. I'm not a huge fan of, of one use gadgets, um, but this is a good one use gadget. Yeah, and I, I was just so happy to see you using it because that's what I do. I always press it because I'm like, why should I be chopping this tiny absolutely. little clove? <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, it's silly. And, and you know, yeah. you can use the garlic press for, um, you could use it for ginger. It liquefies it a little bit, but it's okay. Um, although I find the pre-crushed ginger from the store the only way to do ginger. Um, you could also do shallots in the garlic press if you need a mint shallot. Um, shallots are a little easier to chop because they're often bigger. Um, but again, why? If I have a tool that could do it, I might as well use it. And now I'm gonna add the herbs. There's chives, tarragon, and parsley. If you're really adverse to tarragon and you still wanna do a green goddess, you could um, up the amount of parsley and you'll still get a, a, a flavorful dish. It won't have the pop of the tarragon. Um, tarragon is sometimes a little difficult to find. Uh, I had to go to two stores, but it was at my bonds. So it's, it's, not, it's not a specialty item by any means. It uh, doesn't ship and hold well. So you kind of have to catch it when you can. Um, it's usually at my routes. It wasn't this week. It was at bonds. So herbs and now you've got the lemon juice it's not much lemon juice it's just a tablespoon 
I do use my lemon press. I have lemon reamer, whatever, whatever floats your boat. I like the uh, press because it seeds it as well. And then a little salt and a little more pepper. You'll probably need to adjust salt and pepper. This dish needs to sit for at least an hour. Um, the lemon juice, the salt uh, will draw out some of the flavor from the herbs. It really needs to sit. It's even better the next day. So it's another thing that's great to do ahead of time. And just readjust your seasoning before you're serving. And you're done. You've got a nice thick dip. You could smell the tarragon. You could smell the herbs. This is another dual purpose dip. This is phenomenal on, on grilled salmon. Mm -hmm. Really excellent on salmon. Um, it's also good on lox and bagel. Um, just sort of that, you know, instead of creme fraiche, it's a nice component to sort of add to it. Um, so again, you know, these are, you'll have leftovers. It's a good thing. I, 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 will, I try to use everything. Um, you know, it's difficult sometimes not throwing away food, but uh, I do my best. So we have our dips done. And we're now ready to sort of prepare our crudite for How are we doing on time? Oh my God, it's seven o'clock at the end of the class. You have six minutes, chef. Six Michael. minutes. <laughs> All righty. Imagine I've blanched vegetables. <laughs> but uh, honestly, I'll, I, the chart tells you what to do. It's very simple. Um, and then I'll show off what I did as much of anything. So I've got some baby broccoli. It's not broccolini, but it's, it's close to it. It's a little softer than the hard florette. The way you blanch is boiling water. Most things take about 30, 30 seconds to a minute, and then you plunge it into an ice bath to stop it cooking. What it does for green vegetables is it softens the outer shell just a little bit and sets the color to a bright, bright green. So let me get a quick ice bath and we can blanch something in the background. This is called multitasking. All right. I'll go over some quick crudite and you guys can figure out how I do this. <laughs> um, some nice unusual bits, radicchio. Peel off the outer leaves and throw those away. I like calling those the travel leaves because they get all bruised up and travel. But underneath are nice bitter sort of cup leaves. They have a nice strong root. So you can take the leaf, cut it in half, layer it on the fruit crudite platter. It makes great dipped into the into dressings. Adds a nice pop of color. We've got green beans, peas, asparagus, broccoli, all sorts of different things that aren't carrots. Speaking of carrots, we have some lovely varietals. These are baby red carrots and sort of long carrots with the stems on it. These are great because it's not a stick. It's a little something extra. Another thing that I love, pardon me while I get the broccoli out from blanching, we'll shock it. And you'll be able to tell the difference instantly. It's bright green. It's, okay. it's a little soft. It's way easier, more inviting to eat. Do you blanch all the vegetables? No, um, if, if the chart that I added kind of talks about the vegetables to blanch. A at the end of the day, it's, it's hard green vegetables for the most part. Green beans, asparagus, um, you could do English pea pods, um, all benefit from blanching. Carrots and leafy things you don't need to bother with. What we're gonna do is just kind of throw together some, some veggies. I've got radishes. 
I like leaving some with the nice leaves on if you can. For carrots, if you can't find some with the stems, I make ribbons. Oh. <laughs> and then you make, nice. it looks like old fashioned ribbon candy. And you know, this is that bag of multicolored carrots on there. That's nice and easy to do. Endive leaves, just like the radicchio. And they're great if you have a nice creamy dip because it's like eating romaine. Persian cucumbers, sliced lengthwise. We're so used to seeing cucumbers as a skewer that the lengthwise just a little more inviting, it's different. Green peas, jicama, which is a garbage vegetable, let's face it. It doesn't have much flavor, but it holds its shape super well. Cookie cutter makes little flowers out of Look jicama. how cute those are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, super, it's super cute. Little cookie cutter, press it in. You could press four at a time, um, rounds. So you have little jicama chips on here. Pre-done, I love the mini sweet peppers. Throw some of our broccolini on there. Some baby red carrots. And then I love to garnish with a cut pomegranate. It's just so bright and jewelful. Somebody wants to get in there with a spoon, great. But one of the fun things about living where we do is everyone knows somebody with a pomegranate bush. So you rarely have to buy one of these. It's ready to go. I'll put green beans on there. We will have blanched the green beans. There would have been asparagus. This is about as quick as I could do a veggie platter. And wow. we're good to go. Wow. A lot more inviting than carrot sticks oh. and celery. Um, yeah. And then, you know, with the cups of the dips on here, man, it just makes you want to eat it. And, and that's, that's that at the end of the day is what cooking is all about, is sharing the food with the people you love and having a good time doing it. Yeah. How's that for seven o'clock? Great. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good job. <laughs>